Welcome everybody, this is Philip Tracy, editor at RCR Wireless News. I'm here with Kevin Kleinsmith. He's the solutions architect at Parallel Wireless. Now they are a small cells uh, solutions company with a flexible backhaul. Kevin, thanks for speaking with me today. Thank you. Here at uh, Small Cells Americas. Um, so tell me a little bit about, to kind of introduce the company. It's a pretty young company, four years old. Four years Can you tell old. us about Parallel? Parallel Wireless has uh, been around for four years. We're uh, focused on the small cell space with our head neck gateway as well. Um, our main focus is that we're trying to connect the unconnected. So in the planet, people don't realize that there's around four billion people that don't have access to the internet today. And that's a huge problem that we're actually trying to take on. It's a difficult problem. The, the main hurdles that most people talk about are not only the capital constraints to put cell sites in these extremely remote areas of the world, but it's also the OPEX and the operational cost to deploy the people to actually support those once you've actually deployed them. Yeah. Uh, myself, I come from a, a rural carrier here in North America background, uh, spending almost seven years building out Wyoming, which is our least populated state with uh, around half a million people covering an area of 100,000 square miles. So that's about five people per square mile. When you're dealing with those kind of remote conditions, it becomes very cost prohibitive for carriers to deploy the solution Hence why there's so many uncovered people. Even in North America, uh, the last conference we had here, uh, Chairman Wheeler was talking about having 15% of the highways across the United States completely uncovered. So it's not just a problem in the world, it's actually a problem here at home where there's yeah. still one to two percent of the population that don't have access to cellular services today. So what are your small cell solutions? What are some of the benefits? How does it fix those problems? Well, first and foremost is our very cost effective. So we attack the capital constraints by being a much more cost effective solution to cover the similar type coverage into those areas. We're also more uh, agnostic to the backhaul. So we can be any type of IP backhaul at all. We'll allow our uh, small cells to have connectivity to our heterogeneous network gateway. Uh, the other thing is that the OPEX side, uh, our goal is to be easier than Wi-Fi to deploy. So it doesn't require a lot of training for us. We've actually had in one of our trials at the Super Bowl last year, uh, the FBI technicians who had never seen our equipment before actually installed our equipment and we were up operational in a few hours. So, so it doesn't require the massive amount of training that you're used to seeing with the highly trained technical staff. We've had people that were actually automobile repossession people install our equipment in the past as well. So um, we don't have that situation of highly trained staff. Um, our consum power consumption levels are much lower than uh, a traditional macro site as well, so it doesn't have to require the commercial power grid. And then our backhaul being so flexible, you don't have to have either a fiber or a microwave solution. We're actually capable of using satellite backhaul okay. and then our own integrated mesh backhaul to provide that solution over the horizon uh, to get beyond where the traditional macro network covers today. And so you're talking about flexibility, so that's a that's a big part of parallel wireless, your the ability to to you know connect the unconnected. Um, a couple of areas I know you specifically work on are public safety and rural areas. Exactly. Um, if we could introduce maybe this device here. I know yeah, this, this is our, part of the, the public this safety. This is our section. in vehicle, uh, which mm -hmm. we're doing a lot of trials with public safety. Uh, this is a very flexible unit, so it's not just for public safety. It could be for any type of deployment mm -hmm. on air, land, or sea, actually. So um, what it does is it uses a different flexible backhaul uh, within the backhaul modules here. Um, you have a number of ports in. It could be one of seven bands going out to create a hotspot of coverage. Uh, the idea here is that the first responder is showing up on site. Instead of them being relying on a macro network, uh, they would actually bring the coverage with them to create that bubble of coverage for the first responders, um, which is a big deal here, say, in Dallas from the experience they had last fall. All those uh, cars converging in that area would actually have brought their own network to increase the ability to have communication instantaneously. Uh, on the other side, this is our uh, two by five watt. Um, this is actually the, the smallest base station in the world. Um, oh, wow. It's actually fully contained where you have the ethernet in. Uh, these are the outputs as well. 
uh, for the standard outputs. Mm -hmm. Also could have an integrated antenna. So this would be the entire unit um, with the GPS unit on top. And you can see that it's actually extremely light. Wow. So it's available for that. dynamic deployment. So it doesn't have to be a traditional on a tower or on a rooftop. Uh, these could be uh, flexible deployments, say uh, tethered to a balloon or alternate solutions like that. Uh, we've actually done some trials with that. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. The in the air, so in tethered air. to a balloon, and that's used with in rural areas mostly, or. Some in the rural areas, mm -hmm. uh, it also could be for um, where I live in the Rocky Mountains, we have a lot of forest fires. Mm -hmm. So instead of them trying to get a cow or sell on wheels, those are very difficult to get into re remote areas. The idea with the balloon and tethering it to a balloon is that you'd only need to have an air supply and a cable and you'd be able to deploy this. Uh, those could also be done for hotspot situations uh, for events like a Super Bowl or we're actually doing a trial this week uh, for uh, a marathon. So just any type of situation where it's a temporary solution, mm -hmm. uh, instead of having to bring in a hardened vehicle, these would be a soft vehicle that you could deploy just for that temporary time frame that's needed. And behind you, I, I wanted to ask, you have a banner that says self-configuring, self-optimizing, and self-healing. Can you right. talk about those points? Just those are the, the flexibility and the ease of deployment. Mm -hmm. So self-organizing and self-optimizing, that's part of the 3GPP standards that are coming out. Um, self-organizing is the concept that when you initially deploy it, the, the technician doesn't have to tell the cell site anything. It actually determines based upon the GPS that's built into it, where is it in the network, so it can build the proper neighbor relations without having an engineer actually take care of that for you. you. Self-optimizing then takes that a step further and it looks at all the traffic and sees how well it's performing. And if it's performing poorly, it'll actually start adjusting itself to try to make it uh, proper in that area so it's not interfering with other cells around it. Mm -hmm. The self-healing is part of the flexible backhaul. So if we have a backhaul outage, we can actually reroute the traffic dynamically so that it takes the proper path on to the head net gateway so that a technician doesn't have to roll out to a cell site. In the rural areas, um, just in Wyoming, sometimes it would take us 14 to 18 hours to get to a cell site location. So that's a long time for the system to be down. Right. By self-healing, now can actually dynamically reroute the traffic mm -hmm. to make sure that you get up to five nines reliability mm -hmm. uh, on the backhaul, which then gives you a much better robust uh, experience to your customers.